call to order this meeting of the Town of Groton Select Board on Monday, August 26th. Um, we are just coming out of an executive session and heading into our regular meeting, we will have announcements and review of the agenda followed by a public comment period. We will then have the town manager's report, which includes our agenda schedule, um, an update on the tri-board meeting this morning, talking about fiscal 21, uh, an update on the fourth quarter financial status closing out fiscal 19. We will talk about our calendar year 19 board goals. We will have an update from the Prescott Oversight Committee. We will consider appointing Ray Capes to the Complete Streets Committee, and we will potentially consider ratifying amendments to the agreement between the Town of Groton and IAFF Local 4879. That's all before 7.15, <laughs> at which point we will meet in joint section with the Groton members of the school committee to appoint uh, someone to a one-year vacancy that will go until the spring election. Under other business, we will discuss uh, our packets of information that we get and whether to publish those in advance. We will discuss the select board email address and then in our packets was a letter that I had drafted <coughs> um, to the water commissioners regarding the iron and manganese. We can talk about that or some version of that. We then have all of our ongoing issues. We have liaison reports and we have one set of minutes to approve. So, um, announcements. May, if, if I may, um, I'd like to take items six and seven at the beginning before the 715, get those out of the way, and then we can go right into uh, the school committee uh, joint session and then back to the, um, because I don't think I'm gonna get through the tri board update no. in 10 minutes. I don't think so. I'll try. But I don't see that happen. Any other announcements from the Okay. Comments or questions from the public? All right. Um, with regards to the uh, item number six, the Complete Streets Committee has a vacancy. They're asking that Ray Capes be appointed uh, to uh, the committee with a term to expire June 30th, 2020. I'd ask the board to consider making that appointment this evening. Ray Capes is a former uh, elected member of the planning board uh, where he did, in my judgment, a very, very good job. He's also been a rep um, for the planning board while not an elected member to one or more of the um, Massachusetts regional planning um, groups, study teams. So I, I highly recommend it. Okay. Are you making that motion? John, you want to turn that into a motion? I move that we appoint Ray Capes to the Complete Streets Committee for a period of June what, 30, till 2019. Ah, 20. Till, uh, until June 30th, 2020. I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So the, the board had an executive session earlier this evening to review with me and the fire chief. Uh, proposed amendments to the union agreement between the town and, and local uh, 4879 uh, IAFF uh, which, to implement. Which is the fire department. Fire union, yes, thank you. Uh, to implement 24 hour <coughs> shifts. As the board is aware, we're planning on going to 24 7 coverage effective September 16, 2019. In order to do that, we needed to meet with the union and hammer out some of the contract language that directly affected um, the implementation of those shifts. Because right now we don't have those shifts. We, we operate on 12 hour shifts, not 24 hour shifts. So we had two meetings with the union. We discussed uh, the various changes and we came to an agreement on all of the wording changes within the contract. Uh, the one area that I wanted to point out to the, uh, a lot of them are just administrative changes on how vacation accrues and things like that that doesn't affect the budget. The one thing that does affect the budget, but we did budget for it uh, when, we, when we went to the uh, town meeting to hire those two additional firefighters, was the way we pay holiday pay. Right now they get paid 12 hours of holiday pay at time and a half uh, when they work the holiday. Now a holiday is 24 hours, so we will be paying 24 hours of holiday pay instead of 12. The impact on the budget over the next 18 months, less than 18 months, about 16 months, uh, from September of 2019 through the end of the contract, which is June 30, 2021, will be um, approximately $8,000. 
but that is the only financial impact of the changes of the 24-hour shifts. But again, we accounted for that in the budget when we went to town meeting. Uh, the other thing that happened was in the uh, contract, in the, in the union is a position of captain within the fire department. The captain's position um, became vacant recently, and the way the union contract reads, only lieutenants with three or, year, three or more years of experience are eligible to apply for the promotion. The two union employees who were eligible uh, for the position chose not to apply for it, thereby leaving it vacant, which created an issue because the captain's position worked Monday through Friday, eight to four, to allow us to have uh, four people on during the day, which was the way we discussed 24-hour shifts with the public. Um, so what we did is we went to the union and we asked them uh, to give up some of the duties of the captain and allow us to create the position of deputy fire chief. The union has agreed to that. So we will be filling a position, the fire chief as strong chief, who's the appointing authority, will be filling the position of deputy fire chief. That will become effective as close to September 16th as possible. He's going through the search right now uh, for that position. The pay rate will be somewhere between $100,000 and $105,000 annually. I will tell you the captain with overtime in fiscal 18 earned, or fiscal 17 earned $107,000, in fiscal 18 earned $108,000, and in fiscal 19, while the position was vacant for quite some time, earned $97,000 with overtime. So paying 100 to 105 has no financial impact on the budget because that's what we're paying now and the deputy fire chief's position will not get overtime. So the union has agreed to allow us to fill that position of deputy fire chief with the duties of the captain to work that Monday through Friday, uh, eight to four uh, hour shift. So that said, I would ask the select board to this evening to consider ratifying two things. One, the wording changes in the contract to allow for the implementation of a 24 hour shift. And the second, would be to authorize the side letter creating the position of deputy fire chief. Those are the two votes I'd ask the select board to consider taking in public this evening. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Um, can they be one vote for both things? No, I only have, have to two, be two separate. I would like two separate votes, please. Because one's an agreement, one's a side letter. <clears throat> if that's okay with the board. Okay, so I would entertain a motion to first um, approve the wording changes in the contract. I'd be happy to make that motion. I move that we approve the uh, amendments to the agreement between the town of Groton and the IAFF Local 4879. That would be the professional firefighters of Groton for the contract period July 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion on that? Do we need to do roll call votes on this? Or Not on this, nope. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I heard that unanimously. Would someone like to make a motion to approve the addendum number one to create the deputy chief position? Yes, I move that we vote to approve the side letter, is that what we're calling this? Mm -hmm. To create the position of deputy fire chief. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any other discussion? I just wanna say, I think um, that our, this negotiation went very smoothly and I think we're all very happy with the way that we're gonna be able to implement 24 seven coverage on September 16th, is that their, that's our target date? Um, this is a, a big step for the town, and I think uh, it bodes well that things went smoothly in the negotiation. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous as well. We still have um, a few minutes uh, before um, 7.15, so I'd like to go through some of the ongoing issues, if that's all right with you, yeah. Allison, Please. and the board. Uh, to give you an update on the uh, Senior Center uh, building project, we're still on target for October 22nd. Things have really progressed uh, nicely. Doors are installed, windows inside are installed, painting is getting done, kitchen has been completely tiled, and uh, equipment being installed uh, in the kitchen. So we're very pleased with the way things are going. So that project continues down a path of, uh, of uh, completion. 
Can I just yes, ask, please. October 22nd is the target date to Move begin in. using it? Yes. And do we have plans for some sort of public? Kathy is working on that. I'm sure there will be huge announcements when it's ready to go. So there'll be some Public open advanced. house Correct. to come and see it. It Correct. is going to be quite spectacular. Yep. So that, that's where we are with that. With regards to the town hall renovations, hmm. things have progressed uh, quite incredibly since we met last. Um, the assessor's office change with the uh, window is just about done. Really came out nice. I think it's exactly the way uh, Jonathan and I hoped it would come out. Uh, so if you get a chance to walk by there tonight, take a look. Uh, we're waiting for two things to finish it, the glass window and the laminate for the countertop. And then that project, there's just some painting and some flooring stuff that has to be done as part of the rest of the town hall renovations, and then that will be done. So we're quite pleased uh, about that. Um, they were working very diligently up here today, putting in the baseboard, filling holes in the wall, getting it ready for painting. And I believe painting is going to commence tomorrow, hopefully. hopefully. Knock on wood. Uh, painting should commence tomorrow. They did all of the wall board and plastering on the first floor. I don't know if you had a chance to go down there and see it. That's coming uh, along. That will also be painted. We're hoping to get the count, uh, the carpets installed over the next week or so, and hopefully Dawn and I will be moving back, and Patricia and Sarah will be moving into their uh, back to their offices next week, beginning part of next week, which we're really excited about. Uh, trailer living is not for me. I just want you to point that out. Um, but I, I don't know how Patricia, I think you like, <laughs> you know why. Um, I can't wait to get back into the into the town hall. Um, but that that's ongoing. The one area, uh, the, the two remaining areas that are gonna be a little bit delayed is there was a two week order time on the counters for the kitchen downstairs. So those have been audited. We expect those to be in uh, in a couple of weeks. And then we are trying to figure out exactly when they're going to start installing the, the, the new flooring uh, outside the two offices. I will tell you, they're going to start, we'll close town hall an hour early on Friday, that weekend. They'll come in and they will work over the weekend, two consecutive weekends to get the floors done because what they have to do, not only install the floors, but then they have to sand and refinish all of the floors to get it to match as close as possible all the way down to the stairs on both uh, the first floor and the second floor. Um, so those are the, that's the only delayed thing, but hopefully we're going to get everybody back into the building and those trailers out of the parking lot, I would say within the next week and a half or two weeks, uh, once it's all said and done. So that renovation uh, continues um, to, to, to go well. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I thought I saw you put your hand up, John. No, I, it appeared to me tonight when I poked my head in that um, all the electric power and uh, network connections seem to be in place, which is stuff that went behind those walls. Yep. Yeah. So they did, a, they did a good job, and the plumbing work went, re went really well also. So we're very, very pleased with the way things have, uh, things have been going uh, with, with that. It's a little slow, a little frustrating, but I would say between uh, Rebuildex and um, Service Master, they've really done a good job serving us. And then Greg O'Sullivan, who did the work for us in the assessor's office, did a great job too. And so those projects are getting done, and hopefully by the end of September, People will come in and not even notice that anything had happened in town hall. So with the floors, you said it's going to take two weekends? Is that like just one weekend for one floor and one for the second, or there's two different applications? I think putting the floor down and then sanding it, I don't think they're going to get it all done in one weekend. So I think, and then finishing it. Right. So I think the first weekend is putting it down, sanding it, second weekend finishing it. So That's, it's going to be usable during It's going to be usable during that week, absolutely. That's the one question that we all ask to make sure that yeah. right. the town hall can be used when that goes on, and the answer was yes. Are they going to put only one coat? I think there's two coats, and it takes be. 24 hours to finish So that's it. probably what drives the, the three weekend. weekends, right. and you being able to use the floor Correct. after the first weekend because yep. it will have a, the first layer of Correct. poly. So that's why it's two, poly, two weeks. Yeah, polyethylene. Um, so miraculously i finished those two updates and it's 7 15 and i see the school committee is here if you guys want to come up to the when, ladies and gentlemen I'm sorry. when the town hall renovations finish up will you give us kind of a financial updating yeah, to let you know exactly what we spent absolutely thank you this is our third time together today very exciting jeff how you been very good thank you so there is um so before we 
we start, if I may, call us to order. Yes. Call the school committee to order. Would be nice, right? Mm -hmm. School committee to order for uh, August 26th meeting, joint with the select board. So there is a vacancy on the uh, regional school committee. Uh, it is a uh, three-year uh, seat. The way this will work when the board decides if the school committee and board can come to an agreement on appointment tonight, whoever you appoint, there are two applicants, uh, Peter Cronin and Ann Doble. Um, when the board and the school committee makes that appointment, it'll be through the May election, and then that person will have the opportunity, if they decide to, to run for the remaining two years on that seat. So that's where we are. I see Peter's here. Is the other applicant here? She could not attend. She had a prior engagement. Okay. So um, that's where we are. And I'll leave it up to the board now to figure out what you want to do next. Um, so I don't know, Marlene, have you guys spoken with the candidates? Have you gotten um, more information well, than we had? Or? More so email than, than okay. spoken. Um, Anne's email was pretty uh, elaborate in regards to her background. Uh, that's been shared yep. um, with everyone here. Um, Pete, um, clearly, he's already served on the school committee. He was on the school committee when we were doing um, the audits in regards to negotiations. Um, I think uh, Mark, Mark actually served as well on those on those. We're very closely with Peter and enjoyed the experience. I thought he did a great job. So both uh, very good candidates. Um, we've just actually had a very short meeting just to discuss it ourselves. Um, and um, I. I can summarize them, or we can all individually speak about it, but where it's a one-year um, appointment is what we're discussing, and we're in a, a year where we have contract negotiations and we're still finalizing, uh, finishing out on that last leg of the audit and all those changes, um, having someone with prior experience with all of that is probably in a uh, school committee's best interest, uh, taxpayers' best interest. So um, our collective opinion was going with someone with experience for the one year um, and whether um, Pete was to continue two years later or Ian chose to go for two years then right. um, or anyone else for that matter you know fantastic but right now we're filling a year slot all right very good questions thoughts I just want to ask Peter if um, work wise and family wise are you going to have He's not the, Peter. the He's time not. that you've put into it, that you're going to have to put into it? Yeah, please. Grab the microphone, please. Uh, thank you. Since uh, I served on the school committee, I've had a fairly significant change in uh, my professional life. Now I work out of my home office instead of having a long commute. It's given me a lot of extra uh, uh, time to pursue other outside interests, so I have uh, plenty of time to devote to this. Thank you. Other questions? I'll get your name sometime. <laughs> I'm Brian. Hi. I'll give you some <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Since only Peter's here, I guess this is going to go to you. Um, so you chose not to run at the conclusion of your term last time. And now, with this vacancy occurring, you've stepped up to the plate and put your name in. I guess my question to you is, why did you choose not to run for re-election? And then now you want this. So you explained you have more time, but what was the rationale for not running again? Uh, at the time, I had just completed a three-year term, um, including leading the collective bargaining team and leading the curriculum with instruction uh, assessment team uh, while juggling a fairly long commute and heavy travel requirements for my job, and I was. Uh, I was starting to get burned out at the time. Uh, that's why I chose not to run. As I mentioned previously, my, my situation has changed fairly significantly since then. I've had a little time to uh, recharge. I have vested interest in the continued success of the district, uh, having been part of the strategic planning committee, the capital plan, the technology plan, the selection of the superintendent, uh, who feel that uh, they're strongly suited to help the school community continue their great work for the Thanks. Yeah, Becky. Um, so, as I consider the two applicants, I guess um, 
the choice that we have is between someone who does have the experience, um, and that's always valuable, especially when you're in the middle of negotiations. But the person um, who had been elected was brand new to the board, mm -hmm. and so the board was going to be dealing with a brand new uh, person, and, and the other, the woman who stepped forward at this point obviously is new to the school committee role, but brings really quite a wealth of educational experience reading her. I don't know her personally at all, but reading the letter of application. <coughs> so um, it's hard to, for me to necessarily say one is better, but I guess I, my inclination is that I think bringing new people in to government is a good thing. <laughs> and so I don't want to, I don't want to discourage that from this woman. And I, I think at this point that is probably how well it will vote. Um, so for, yeah, go ahead. Jeff. Yeah, so just, uh, just, you know, obviously I'm not going to change your mind, but my, my opinion is uh, there's nine months here. Uh, so for this interim position, that's not a lot of time. Uh, when I was new to the school committee, it seemed like it took at least 12 months to get up to speed on a lot of stuff. Um, so from that standpoint, having somebody who's been through that previously, who understands the regulations, the process, um, just helps to get up to speed faster. You know, if, if it, and I agree with you, I think she's got impressive experience, brings that educational background from, you know, the educator side of things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'd love to see her run in, in May or in the spring for the position because, uh, and then have the two years to fill out the remainder of that term and, you know, mm -hmm. potentially re-up again after that. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say very similarly that to me, you know, a nine month or a one year vacancy you really need someone who could hit the ground kind of running. Um, and in this case, I think the experience, um, much as I think Ann is a, a great candidate, the experience is, is what we need to make that interim or, or really active <coughs> participant. So, any other questions, concerns? All right. This vote does have to be roll we'll call. Okay. And it's, we're, we're like one joint committee at this point, so any one of us can make a motion and- Somebody makes it, somebody seconds it, and then you do roll call. Who would, would like make to make a motion? motion that we appoint Peter Cronin to the vacancy on the Groton Dunstable Regional School Committee. I'll second, second that motion. Alrighty. Any further discussion? All right, uh, we need to do roll call. Manugi and I. Riley, I. Dig and I. Pine, nay. Geiger, I. <laughs> Cubic, I. Marlena, I. LeBlanc, I. So, good. Peter, congratulations. congratulations. There will be a letter or a l electronic transfer done in the town clerk's office first thing tomorrow morning. So, before you serve on the school committee, please go down and get sworn in by the town clerk. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Do you need the school committee as a whole for anything else? I think that that's all we formally have. We, of course, we'd love to see you stay and express opinions on everything. I have a feeling we'll have some many joint meetings ahead. <laughs> so I would Hypothetically. To adjourn. So moved. Awesome. All in favor. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. <laughs> that's fine. All right. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. You too. All righty. So do we want to return back to the town manager's report? Yes. So item number two, I set aside time this week uh, for the, to give the board an update on the work of the so-called tri-board uh, that has been working on preparation for the FY21 budget. They met this morning, I think we met for about an hour and a half, and I've given you some information beforehand, uh, and I, there's some more information I want to uh, give you tonight that I sent out this afternoon. I will try not to uh, make this too long. Could you, excuse me, I'm sorry for interrupting, could you just explain to all of us what the tri-board is. Yep, it's a committee, uh, it's a, it's not a, a, a posted committee, but it is a group representing the town's select board, the town's finance committee, and the Groton Dunstable portion uh, school committee reps from Groton. 
So sitting in the room today was Bud Robinson uh, representing the Finance Committee, Allison Manugian representing the uh, Select Board, Brian LeBlanc and Marlena Gilbert representing the School Committee, Sherry Kersey, who is the new School Business Manager, uh, of course, Dr. Chesson, myself, and I invited the finance team uh, this morning because we, we talked a lot about how we get to growth and there's some numbers out there that I thought was very helpful. So it was a very good meeting this morning. There was a lot of shared information. Uh, we went through a lot of uh, different information. So I want to just briefly go through some of the things we discussed this morning and, and give you an idea of where we're, where we're headed. And Allison and Bud and, and finance team, please feel free to jump in if I if I miss anything. Logistically, Mark? Please. So the information you sent out to us after Tribor came in an email, has that been that is incorporated in the into the package? We will get, so we we will get to it. One. Absolutely. Perfect. It's, it's all you. the same thing. Um, so this is how we calculate out the levy limit. I wanted to give an FY20 update. Um, new growth has was originally estimated at $20 million. New growth now is at $27 million, and there is a, a main reason for that. The actual growth was about 18 million in new construction, commercial, personal property. There was another 11 million dollars uh, that came in, nine to 11 million dollars that came in in growth because of a decision that the board made with the finance committee two years ago to appropriate money to do a full measure and list in the community. We had said at the time that the board and the finance committee approved it in ultimately town meeting that we would generate additional growth by doing that because people that didn't put building permits to finish their basements, put on decks, things like that. Well, he did it, he was supposed to take three years, they did it in 18 months, and we picked up a lot of growth this way. So that's good news. That added $126,770 uh, to, to, to the levy limit this year. And keep in mind, the levy limit now is 100, and the town meeting vote put the estimated levy surplus at $197,000. This is going to add another 126,000 to that, but we're going to take some back, and you'll see in a minute what. Um, we also have to increase the excluded debt for fiscal year 20 by 70,393. That is to cover the ban interest payments on the bans that the board approved at your last meeting for the uh, DPW garage and the library roof. Then, uh, when you look at uh, estimated receipts, you will see that the final. We, we estimated the governor's number at 965. Um, the final budget was 971. So the legislature gave us more than the governor had designated. So there's 6,000 more dollars there, which is good news. So then when we get into the actual budget, I'm proposing a couple of changes uh, here on, on it. One, we're going to be looking to increase the general government budget at the fall town meeting for $20,000. That's to pay for improvements that the board authorized and discussed when we brought the department heads to talk about our financial software. So we'll be looking for a $20,000 appropriation there. We also have to increase the debt service budget by that $70,000 that we're raising uh, on the recap sheet for the, uh, the, the interest payments on the excluded debt for the DPW roof. Uh, the, the legislature actually increased the library uh, offset by $500 to $18,000. Uh, 527 but then they gave us money back on the um, as on the cherry sheet charges we had estimated 93 692 they were only taking 93 392 I think there was a typo somewhere and that's probably what happened and it got corrected but I'm happy with the number the other thing that I want to do though is I'm recommending that we had set aside hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the overlay to handle abatements and other things that, that get charged exemptions the senior work off program and things like that because there was such a major increase in values when they did the full measure list we went to john geiger's house we saw his basement we're going to charge him ninety thousand dollars for that basement we increase his value john's going to get his property tax bill and he's going to, i'm making that up if we did not get a basement <laughs> i'm using that as an example it'd be nice, it'd be nice yeah. um, but people are going to see an increase in their value for that stuff that we picked up. I'm anticipating a higher impact of, of abatement requests to the assessors based on that. So I want to increase the overlay by 50 grand to cover that. So I want to take some of that new growth that we got and put it in the overlay. If we don't spend it, it'll be available for future town meeting appropriation should that need arise like snow and ice deficit and things like that. But I really think we need to do that. So that's a recommendation I'm making. Yes, Joshua. So the number had been 150,000. Yes, right? sir. In, in recent 
history, did we not take some of that money to cover other things? We, uh, we, we have. So what is the five-year average? 130000 So in the event, if you kept it at $150,000 and more people came in for abatements uh, for the reasons that you just said, couldn't you go to the reserve fund to get additional money for that? Not on the, not on the overlay. You'd have to hit the overlay reserve, which has about $300,000 in it. We're getting, we're getting to a low level where the Department of Revenue may not certify our tax rate if there isn't enough money in there. They want to make sure you can cover abatement requests because that's the only way you can do it. Otherwise, you have a revenue deficit. So I really think we need to go up that 50000 50, But that's a decision that the, the board and the finance committee will have to make. Is there anything you want to add to that, Jonathan? Yeah, it's, it's, remember, it's abatements and exemptions. So, and it's motor vehicle excise abatements also. So those are all the things that go into, uh, that come out of the old there were a couple of years um, where we, we ran a little bit lean, and we used to, we, I think, I believe when Rena was here, we used to do about uh, 200,000 a year. Correct. And we had dropped it down to 100 one year and 150, so it, uh, and then we had a, a case settled, the state settled the case um, with a major utility, and that uh, grabbed some cash out of the overlay, they settled with them. Uh, so we're kind of getting down to that. We used to carry about 600,000, we're down to under four. Just makes me a little bit nervous if we have a big um, uh, you know, taxpayer in town or a utility file for an abatement. We get down to a certain point and the, and the DOI won't certify our tax rate, so. So I'm, 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 I'm a little nervous and that's why I want to put the extra 50 in there. If we don't spend it, we don't spend <coughs> it. But it's there in the event we need it. Um, so now, with all that taken into consideration, there's an additional $62,000 of unexpended tax capacity. Instead of 197 995 which is what the town meeting had, if everything goes according to Hoyle at the, at the fall town meeting, uh, it'll be a, a surplus of 260000 of unexpended tax capacity to help offset the FY21 budget. That's because of so much new growth? Correct. That's a major portion of it, Becky. Yes. And then you ask yourself, well, what's going to be the impact on the tax rate? We had estimated at the Springtown meeting that the estimated tax rate for next year would be 1859. Can you zoom back a little bit sure. so that people Absolutely. can read that? Yep. Uh, we had, we had uh, estimated that the uh, tax rate at the, at the Springtown meeting would be 1859 if everything passed. With this additional seven million dollars in new growth, the offsets and everything else that would go on with the excluded debt and the like, there won't be a change in the tax rate. We still think the tax rate will be around the 1859. Now that is an estimate. When we get the final new growth certified, the final town meeting votes and all that, the final values approved by the Department of Revenue, it could be more, could be less. But we think 1859 is a pretty good number. Yes, Jonathan. And also. The Board of Assessors had a meeting on Friday and we're, we're in the process of uh, setting uh, values for the town and the previous year we had, we had an increase and we're seeing, I don't know if it's quite a similar increase as we had last year, but we're definitely seeing an increase, uh, especially in- uh, Based on sales? In, yeah, based on sales, especially in condominiums. So if, we, if values go up, then the tax rate will come down a bit. It may come down. We still raise the same amount of money, but the higher the value, the lower the tax rate. So, but 1859 is a pretty good idea of where we'll, where we'll be. Thank you for that, John. That's good. Jonathan, hold on to that. You might need to do that. <laughs> um, so, then I wanted to spend some time, and this is information that I sent out this afternoon, because this is stuff that the tri board wanted to look at and, and understand. And, and one of the things that they wanted to understand is how we generated um, estimated receipts for fiscal 19 and what the outcome was. So when we put the budget together for FY19, and that would have been in December of 2017, we estimated 3.9 million. The actual FY19 receipts in June of 2019 was $4,728,000. So we had a $734,000 more in receipts than we budgeted. Now, 
This is the way we've always done it to be conservative. But you may ask yourself, well, wait a minute, why aren't you spending all that, that extra money? There's a couple of reasons for that. A, we've always budgeted those conservatively. B, this is how we generate free cash, and our free cash policy says we want to generate between 1% and 2% of free cash each year. This is how we do it. So when you look at where the surpluses were, there's a couple of troubling things that I wanted to discuss with the board as to why this was 734000 Motor vehicle excise, um, if, we, if we were to fully fund that um, and, and, and estimate it at what we took in at 1793, that $243,000 would be great, but it would hurt our free cash. We've also seen a downturn in the actual motor vehicle excise. If the board will remember, when I put the budget to you last January, I told you we're seeing a decrease in the number of new car sales. In fiscal year 18, we took in $1.81 million in motor vehicle excise. We only took in 1793 in fiscal 19. Now, that could be a one-year anomaly, but it's the first time in five years that it's been less than the previous year. So I'm concerned about that. The occupancy tax, when we put our estimates together for fiscal 20, we carried 200000 on that number. We went $48,000 more last year. We, we think that's a good number, but the reason we went to 200000 is <clears throat> we know that we have the 3% coming in from the Groton Inn. So we, we estimated that at $50,000. So that's a good number. We think we're going to take that into next year. We're going to estimate 200000 for that. Penalties, interest, and taxes, pretty similar to where we've been. Payment in lieu of taxes, that $21,000, 20 of that is from the Groton School to help offset the um, new uh, school resource officer. We pretty much hit other charges uh, where, we, where we estimated that's the payment from Dunstable. Fees, $392,000. That's, um, Tommy had a really good year at the transfer station and recyclables. Um, it could be a one year hit because the year before we didn't make the budget, this year we exceeded it. So it depends on what the recycling market is. Uh, rentals, because of the success that we had at the country club, um, that was some of the money that, that generated the increase there. Wait, building permits. I'm sorry, it's, that was a question I had. Rentals, it's all the country No, club? it's also the cell towers. We have, what, three cell towers? Most, most of the surplus is the cell towers, I believe, but um, several thousand dollars in fees. Yep. Um, building permits, licenses and permits. Um, some of that, 75,000 of that number is because of the HVAC permit from Indian Hill. I'm getting nervous that we're trending down on building permits because not as many new homes are being constructed. A lot of commercial real estate isn't happening. So I'm really nervous about even making 300,000 on that number in fiscal year 20. The reason it's at, the reason it's at 113, 75 or three quarters of that came from uh, that one permit, which I don't think is gonna happen next year. So I'm a little nervous about that. Investment income, you look at that and say, you budgeted 20, you took in 94, what were you doing? And I asked myself that very question. So I'm going to stop talking and say, Michael, explain why that number is so high. Because again, this is a one year anomaly. We had three issues occur in fiscal 19 that caused the $75,000 variance. Uh, the first issue in early fiscal 19, the interest rate environment for our major uh, two depositories, Main Street Bank and Lowell 5 changed and, and I uh, <clears throat> solicited and, and got a better rate on our uh, deposits. Uh, we went from 1% to 2% and that caused about a $10,000 increase in the general fund interest in fiscal 19. I have since uh, budgeted for that additional 10,000 in FY20. We budgeted 40 in FY20. Uh, the other issue that occurred in fiscal 19 was that we had capital projects ongoing that we had borrowed for uh, through, through uh, bond anticipation notes. In those projects, when they get borrowed, the, the, the outlays, the construction payments don't necessarily occur immediately. So we had uh, quite a bit of money on deposit during fiscal 19 that was earning interest in the general fund that otherwise would not, not have. That same, that same issue has, has leaped over into fiscal 20, and we have, all, we have also added another $10,000 in the budget for fiscal 20 for the money that we have, that we have, that we have to keep. We can't spend it because it has to wait for the, uh, for the 
capital projects to, to cost themselves out. So that was $20,000. The third item was a $40,000 one-time general fund interest income occurrence that was a result of, uh, <coughs> in fiscal 19, we uh, received notification from Morgan Stanley, which was one of our trust fund portfolio managers who had $6 million <coughs> with us. We had $6 million with them, which included uh, a few hundred thousand dollars in general fund money. I need to keep general fund money in this main body of trust fund uh, <coughs> investments because we, we transfer money in and out uh, between the trust funds and, uh, and the general fund as needed. That general fund money is also invested <coughs> the same way that all the trust funds are invested. So we were told during fiscal 19 by this uh, investment portfolio that unless we increased our relationship balance with them from the current $6 million to at least $10 million, we, would, we, were, we were then told we would have to go elsewhere because they were restricting themselves to customers of just $10 million or higher. So as a result of that, we went to a new firm in Worcester called Bartholomew. We, they, they came in with several other firms and they interviewed with the Trust Fund Commission and myself. So we went with the new firm and as a result of the conversion, they rebalanced the entire portfolio and took in uh, one-time realized gains that had built up over the past five years. As a result of that, the general fund money that was in the trust fund balance, or was part of the trust fund balance, received a $39,000 one-time um, infusion of uh, a realized gain. That won't occur again um, uh, in the future. So that represented about sixty-two to $65,000 of, uh, <coughs> of this variance that you see. Thank you, Mike. Um, recreation revenues, that's the country club. We all talked about that a few weeks ago. That was great news. And then the final one is 87000 in miscellaneous non-reoccurring. That's FEMA payback for a storm event that happened in March of 2018, and they reimbursed us in June of 2019. That's not going to happen in fiscal year 20. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited that we had this, but I'm a little nervous going into 20 on what our numbers are going to be. So we're going to continue to be conservative um, in our estimates, and while this helps us and certify our free cash and things like that, there are troubling signs with regards to uh, revenues uh, coming to the town, which, oh. sorry. I guess maybe some of this will come out later as we go through the budgeting process, but um, looking at these figures, we have had feedback in the past about where we must be budgeting to be able to have all that much free cash. Where most of the free cash has come from in, in previous years has been in the motor vehicle excise taxes. And then we had some really good building permit years. But the Department of Revenue likes us to base our estimated receipts. They want us to do it conservatively. They want to see us generating at least 1% to 2% of free cash. That's what our free cash policy that the board adopted says. And this is how we, we budget. Go ahead. 3 to 5. 3 to 5%. So... I'm going to recommend we continue down this path. I'll get to something in a minute that shows where there's some, some trouble, but $734,000 um, of, of the surplus, when you think about it, 87 of it is a one-time hit that we're not going to see again. Another 40 of it is a one-time hit that we're not going to see again. 113,000 of it is 75,000 of a one-time hit we're not going to see again. Um, the meals tax, we're already bumping that up to 200,000 in fiscal 20. So we're already accounting for that increase uh, in, in the number. So that's going to show up next year uh, in, what we, in what we budget. And then motor vehicle excise tax, that is shrinking because we took in less money this year than we took in in 18. So I understand your point, Becky, but I'm really getting a little bit nervous on future trends. And I want to continue to be conservative in our estimates. Right. I mean, certainly the large amount of surplus is very, very good news. Um, we need to do the best we can. I agree. Mark, can you take this Please. page at some point and can you just annotate maybe in another column to the right which, what amounts roughly you think are one time that aren't? Sure. Just so that, I know you just gave it to us all verbally, but. Well, Please, but go ahead. 
it might help as well when you do that to, when you think about the trend here because the 21 number you have, which I don't know if you're going to show it, you probably are. I'm going to get to that. Well, that's a, that needs to probably go here too because it's not, by using that larger number, that 700 is not going to happen. Correct. Unless magic happens some other place. Cause Correct. You're, I'll get to that. Yeah, because Becky's point is correct but you're you're actually taking it down from this big number potentially in 2021 correct um, another thing that that the the, the tri board wanted to see is okay on the town budget all unspent appropriations what happened and where did that money go so all unspent appropriations that's both operating and capital total one million forty thousand four hundred and fifty five dollars of that four hundred and eighty two thousand is encumbered into fiscal year 20 it's to pay for special projects, capital expenses that are out there, uh, bills that came in in late June that we didn't get, bills that were for money that was spent in June and the bills didn't come in until July, things like that. That totaled 482000 so that left 557000 of unspent appropriations. So now you wonder where did the turn backs come from? Well, 83000 is the reserve fund. We budget 150. We only spent 70 of it. I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you explain the word turnbacks? Uh, it's it's things that we're not going to spend, and it gets closed out to free cash. It gets turned back to the general fund. Unexpended. It's money that was raised, and it's unexpended. We didn't spend it. So it's where this one million forty came from. Correct. Okay. Yep. And then four hundred eighty-two is going to be carried over to fiscal twenty. Yep. Yeah, at least five fifty-seven. Of that five fifty-seven. I wanted to go over some of the significant ones over 20,000. I got it. The Thank reserve you. fund is 83 of it. The town manager expenses prior year, we had uh, gone to the finance committee for reserve fund transfer for Prescott in fiscal 18. We never spent the money in 19 because we didn't need to. And so that money got closed out. 64,000 police wages, that's good news. Overtime went down. So kudos to Mike. Um, Luth and the, and the police department for controlling uh, overtime. Dispatch wages, that is money that we had for the grant. We've had that discussion before. Senior sent the van, $21,000. Uh, that has, has a combination of usage, combination of the fact that our poor senior center has been in three different locations during the construction. Um, we reduced that budget by 10,000 in fiscal 20, so we won't see that much of a turn back next year because we reduced it based on the experience. Library wages, there's a whole litany of reasons why that got turned back that we don't anticipate uh, next year. And then the library decided not to do the exterior lights project in the parking lot. They, they did something to address it and they didn't need to spend this money. And then you have $174,000 of miscellaneous town manager turned back 1,000 here, treasurer 1,000 there, and so on and so forth, uh, adding up to the 174,000. So there's not a lot of, um, reasons as to why we did it because of budgetary reasons things just happen through the year when you think about it 83,000 of the of the turn back as a reserve fund so that's a pretty that's good news that we didn't have any uh, emergency a lot of emergencies last year the dispatch wages you said that's a grant yeah we we apply every year for a grant from the e911 the state 911 fund we take in about two hundred and forty thousand dollars some of it is for salaries and wages some of it is for equipment. Wages offset was 144,000 in that grant. But so again, the I previous year was about what 70 or 80,000. It was lower. Yeah. It was lower the year before. It's so it's a recurring thing. This happens every year, right? But we, we budget fully for it, just in case we budget don't get it. for it. We apply for a grant. We always get the grant. Mm -hmm. Well, yep. it's a grant program that could be stopped yep. at at any point that someone on high decides we're not going to give those grants anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's a little less certain than right. tax revenue coming in. And plus, Becky, the year before, wages was only 70, I think 78,000. That number is in my head. Hmm. And obviously this year was a little bit more. So it, it depends. It fluctuates year to year. It depends on what equipment they need, what salaries and things like that. So that's why we fully fund uh, dispatch wages. So then what we did, and this is, Before we go back, please, please, um, Allison. Can you also kind of flesh out to the right what the encumbered amounts, you know, projects are? The 440, the 482? Yep. And then at some point, I think it would be good to see what the miscellaneous unspent are. I know they're all smaller, but if we can. Yep. Um, and then in terms of grants, 
just to throw out there, that's one of the things that the tri board will potentially be returning to discuss a little bit because the, the schools in the town handle them differently in terms of budgeting and accounting. So we may come back and talk more. So then we, we developed a summary sheet going back to fiscal year 15 on where, you know, what the budget looked like, how we spent our money, what the free cash was each year, 1 million here, 1 1.2, 1 1.2, 2.3 and 18 and 2.2 and 19. A lot of that has to do with some commercial building permits that we received from the end and things like that. There was a one-time $800,000 correction that happened in fiscal 18 that generated that number. And then we show you how we've spent that money. So I think this is good information so you can see and then what the remaining amount was each year in free cash. So even though this number was $2.3 million in fiscal year uh, 18, we started with the number 400,000 because we didn't spend all the money the previous year. So we, the free cash generation was actually 1.9 million that year. And then we turned back 100 and um, 77 or 381,000 that led to the 2.3 million or the 2.2 million the following year. This year we spent all but $194,000 um, in, in free cash on these various projects. But it gives you an idea of how we spent and we're estimating free cash for fiscal year 20 that Patricia's working on right now. It's not official, but it'll be in the $1.4 million neighborhood. So it's back to where we were previously. It's not those two high years of 18 and 19, but we'll get that free cash certified before town meeting. So we wanted you to see um, this information. And then this is the chart that Bud was talking about before. If we, Becky, back to your question that you asked, there was 784,000, why don't we spend more of it? So if we do spend 512,000 and we increase those estimated receipts by that amount of money, A, that's gonna kill our free cash, which will hurt some of our capital projects and I think it'll affect our bond rating because we're not following our financial policy. But we, we think where are we gonna be with an override need in fiscal 21? We're still debating that, we're still formulating a budget. We think it's gonna be anywhere between 500 and 1.1 million. Right now, today, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, and we'll continue to work on that over the next couple of months. But I'm a little nervous with some of the downward trends and some of the one-time impacts that we've seen in our estimated receipts that aren't gonna be there in future years. So this sheet here shows you what the original estimate was when I put the five-year plan together, and then working with the tri-board to figure out what we can do with some of our estimated receipts. It still makes it you know, over a five year period, 2.2 .2 million versus 1.8. It's really not that significant of a change over the course of five years. Because if you look up here, if you do 1.1 million this year and 572 this year, the override, anticipated override the following year is less, but more here because you have a smaller base you're starting from and you still have the same anticipated expenses. Again, this is all very preliminary. The tri board is, is, is working these numbers. They're meeting again on September 23rd uh, to go over. We're gonna have better numbers on free cash. We're gonna have the final new growth numbers to, to finalize the budget. We'll work some of the numbers so that when the finance committee and the select board get together the following week on September 30th, because you have to meet around October 1st to give me guidance for the fiscal year 21 process, we'll have more information for you to look at. So there's a, I know there's a lot of stuff that I covered j just now. There's a lot of information. If any of you have questions, I'd be more than happy to sit down with you and talk to you about it. There's just a lot going on right now. Yes, Joe. I just have two, two things. One, I had the understanding that the tri board was the town of Dunstable, the town of Groton, and the school district. That's where the tri came from. But from what I've heard tonight, it sounds like this is only a duet. Uh, the town of Groton and well, the three boards in the town, committee. three boards, the finance committee, select board, school well, committee. But what there, was the there original had previously, try? Originally, when it was, I think, kind of set up, at the, when the school committee was more the driving force, the tri board was the two communities in the district. Right. That, I don't know, kind of 
met for a year or so and sort of fell by the wayside. Dunstable didn't want to meet anymore. Right, and now this is this is kind of a, a new and different tribe board. So you're right, we probably should be calling this a troika or something okay. All right. instead of, but it. it so my, yeah, sec it, my second question is, we're providing all this information to the school district. Is the school district providing to the town of Groton the equivalent information to this from their operation? Not yet. When does that come? They just switched over business managers, and I'm sure uh, the new school business manager is going to be putting all that information together. Um, but this includes, Mark, you have kind of their updated needs for fiscal 20 correct. are well, their wishes. embedded in here. Yeah, I have their well, anticipated their budget. Needs. Wishes. Their anticipated budget. That's a whole budget. other discussion. Right, but, it, but are they telling us how they spent their money in 2019 and to the degree we're doing it here? I haven't seen it. Yeah, are we entitled to ask for it? I, I would, it would I seem so. so. I would yep. think so. So I think we should. I'm very transparent in what I do. Well, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't get to be a duo or a try unless everybody's doing their part. That's where I'm coming from. I answer to this board and the finance committee and I'm giving the information right, so I was asked. Yes, sir. I'll leave it with you. We will reach out and see what we can get. Um, so I unless will, sir, I will just say again, um, uh, a reduced, I mean, the estimate of how much will be needed for an override next year is down a lot, and that's good. Although you just said that's really, no, that's a kind of floating number. Correct. Mm -hmm. So. I think, to Mark, at some point moving forward, if, if kind of you or, or we as a community can pick sort of a standard format for things so that, sure. you know, on one form we've got revenue listed this ways and, and, you know, if we can just kind of standardize that so we're always looking at the same things, that sure. would be helpful. Yep. I, I'm just trying to get as much information as possible to everybody and, and this is a work in progress and I'll continue to work with FinCom and, and the select board to give you what you want. Yeah, Josh. I very much agree with John in, a, in terms of his statement for getting a very similar document and spreadsheets from the school in terms of what the spending was for the, uh, the previous year. Um, without looking at that from what their uh, budget was that was approved, I want to see A, how they're tracking, B, what the trends are that are off, um, and, and what the positives are. Because you can't put together a argument for an override without understanding what the municipal and what the school needs are jointly. So if you could formalize that and get that document, because what you've put together for us is very useful, and what you put together for them is very useful, but it's, it's not the complete picture that I think we all need to see. Okay. Excellent. So we're getting right from the frying pan into the fire for fiscal 21. I'll continue <laughs> to update the board uh, as we go. Um, I, wanted, I, I thought this morning's meeting, Bud and Allison and, and, and the team, the finance team, I thought it was a good discussion. We covered a lot of uh, information, mm -hmm. and I think uh, the, the lines of communication are wide open. So I don't think there's a problem getting Josh and John no. what they're talking about tonight. So I see that happening. Um, so the next thing on my uh, town manager report is the fiscal year uh, 19 fourth quarter update. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over this right now because I just did. Mm -hmm. I showed you the numbers on receipts. I showed you the numbers on expenses. Uh, this is the form that Patricia does every quarter for you. Um, you already have it. I've already talked about what the numbers are. So I'd be more than happy to answer any additional questions you have, but I think you see that fiscal 19 was a good year for the town in terms of receipts, expenditures. Our overall financial uh, health is strong, and I hope we can continue that in fiscal 20. Is there anything that you want to add to that? Bud, are there any questions that you have? No, I just for people who haven't been on the board a long time. This, we always generate cash for this, the reason we look here. If you look at 19, I think the important, there's two numbers up there. One is the achievement to budget for revenue, which is at 101%, I think it is, yep. rounded. And then the expense line below there is 96%. If you go back five years, those numbers other than 18 was just an abnormality because of the Indian Hill and um, the tax pulling. 
it was 101, then it was 104, 18, then 17, 101, 16, 101, 15, 102, and 14, 102. So we always consistently generate one or two percent more revenue. Expenses were 96 percent, if you go back, 18 was 97, 17 was 97, 16 was 95, 15 was 97, 14 was 97. We're very, very there consistent. is a very consistent pattern here, which is what we just talked about as far as cash generation. We just, and we'll discuss this more in the try, whatever we're going to call it, to see what, <laughs> how much we can potentially maybe change that a little bit. But we still need the free cash for the big things like capital. We've been, cons I, I, but that's interesting that we've been very consistent in the way we do our business. And, and that's, I think there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. We have a finance team that's been in place for a number of years. We know what we're doing. We have good support from the FinCom and the, and, and the select board and ultimately the taxpayers in town meeting. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm glad you talked about that. I think that's great. Any other questions on this? Okay, when we do the um, fourth, when we do the financial update, we also do a calendar year update. And when I was putting this together for the board, I got very excited because we made very achievable goals this year and we worked hard on them, and I think we're showing a lot of great progress. So I want to take a couple of minutes with the board's indulgence, if I may, um, Allison. Yeah. Uh, updating you on where we are. So with terms of uh, select, thank you, finance team. I appreciate you being here tonight. Um, with regards to the, the calendar goals, goal number one was select board functioning. We wanted to work on putting agendas out and things like that. We did that over the summer. Um, we've done some meetings with some of our boards. Allison and I will, will get together and we'll put together the next several agendas. Now that we've reached the end of August, we're gonna be going into a, a more weekly, after next week, into a more weekly meeting schedule. So we'll work on, on getting that out. So I would say this goal is, is, is ongoing and, it's, and we're doing what we said we were going to do. We've had a couple of updates from some committees. Um, and I know one of the things we were talking about was uh, uh, how we're going to appoint committee members, which we need to talk about when we get into the uh, goal number two. But I know Becky has been working on that, and I think you were planning on giving an update tonight on that, Becky. Mm -hmm. So we get to that later on in the meeting when we do our uh, ongoing issues update. We'll talk about that. But I'd say this goal is well on its way to being met. Goal number two is the uh, major initiative uh, committee. Uh, Josh and I put together a proposed charge for the committee. The board adopted that, subject to amendments offered by the FinCom, who are meeting next Tuesday night, September 4th, to review the charge. They will give us back their feedback. In the meantime, we advertise for this committee, and as of uh, 4 o'clock today, or 5 o'clock today, we received 11. We received one more, Becky, after I talked to you. There are 11 people who express an interest. I asked Don today to email all 11 applicants and let them know that this will probably be on the agenda either September 16th or 23rd for interviews. I want to wait until the FinCom reviews the charge, gives you feedback, allows you to debate it, send it out to them again, and then do your interviews after that. So it'll probably be around the, we'll probably talk about the charge on the 9th after the FinCom meets on the, 20, on the 4th. You guys can look over the FinCom's comments, put it on the agenda for adoption on the, 20, on the 16th, and then maybe do the interviews on the 23rd or, or something like that. Does that make sense? Okay. What so size did we decide? Five. We decide? Oh, that's so you have 11 applicants, and that's why Becky's appointing thing, the way we do it now is you vote, right. and then, which right. works, but if you want to tweak that, fine. If not, that's what we'll probably move forward with. But I would say this goal is well on its way uh, to being completed. With regards to the green communities, um, we did receive the grant. I believe I sent you out a copy of that last week. So we are well on our way for filing our grant application on um, in October. So I'm very happy about that. The M M MRPC and, will be helping us. And it's only they've only just begun. On Correct. That, right. Yep. Okay. Yep. If um, you know if there are any issues that come up in the department heads as we go through that, you'll keep us informed. Absolutely will. This is important. This is an important goal we want to get uh, done in the fall. Mark, does MRPC have a set kind of process or protocol to help us determine when we want to set those start and end dates for the first three-year? Yeah, that's three part of what window. she's working on with us. Okay. So yes, we will, have, um, we will have that ongoing. Yes. I'm just making myself a note. 
if you'll indulge me for a minute. Um, with regards to determining the level, affordable levels of public safety, last meeting you had the police chief and the fire chief in here. They've given you, um, I don't want to rehash what they did, they gave a very two hour um, presentation last week, uh, last meeting, but I, I, just to summarize it, the police chief feels he, he needs another year to evaluate the police department at full staffing. He suggested that there is something about needing two additional dispatches. That could be something that the major initiatives committee takes on one of their first tasks uh, to, to, to look at once you get them up and running, or the finance committee. Uh, the fire chief, you know, wants to continue recruiting called firefighters. I put in, in here, there are 10 applicants that have come through on the last charge. He's hoping to get six of them as called firefighters. So that's good news. So there is interest. All of this discussion in public has been very positive, getting people to come forward. Um, and also with regards to the emergency management function, you ratified my appointment of Steele as the EM director. He's working over the next several months formulating an operational plan. So I'd say this goal is well on its way uh, of being completed. Review all select board policies. Town Council, who is here tonight, uh, gave us all of his comments. The next step in the process is for Allison and I, and we're meeting Friday morning at 8 o'clock uh, to start going through the policies to bring them back to the select board. So Town Council did his job. Now it's up to Allison and I to do our job to bring back final proposed policies to the board. So this goal is well on its way uh, of being completed. And, and I think I had mentioned before, but it seems to me that when we get to the point of reviewing everything that you're going to recommend, we should do that at a workshop session. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, because yeah. that's going to be a lot of work back in there, yeah. right? Um, with regards to this one, the operating budget of the school uh, and town district, we just spent the first part of this meeting reviewing that discussion. So that, you know, there's full communication uh, between the schools and the town. So we're, we're, we're moving forward on that particular goal. So I'm very happy uh, that we've met that. Um, oh, yes, please. I, I guess I would point, uh, I just want to point out and I'm reiterating something I said earlier. It doesn't sound as though the communication is equally strong in both directions. Understood. We'll work on that. We'd like the direction of the town side of communication, though, right? I'm fine with that. Thank you. <laughs> we put all the cards on the table. I think that's what everybody needs to do. Um, with regards to goal number seven, I'll defer, you know, Becky has been appointed to the um, housing trust to replace Josh. I'm not sure where we are with this, Becky. I don't know if you have well, an update. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of embarrassing. It looks like we haven't done anything. Um, I think, I've said this before, um, it is frustrating to me that there aren't, or so far I have not discovered, <laughs> good options for what the select board can actually do uh, toward um, getting more lower cost housing in this town. Um, I, I would say there are some things that have happened, but they have happened by other groups. The housing production plan had a big uh, meeting in, I think, June, end of June, um, and, got, and they're well at work on gathering data and writing the report that is required. That's, that's being overseen by the planning board, I think. Um, and the house, and now that I'm on the Affordable Housing Trust, that group is meeting later this week to also continue discussion of that. Um, I understand that market forces generally uh, control what gets built on land that developers build what will make money for them, and I can't fault them for that. Uh, however, just if anybody is listening, <laughs> uh, I think there is a demand for smaller housing for over 55 population, the over 55 population in this town, not necessarily subsidized. Um, and so I continue to hope that some way we will find some way to construct some of that housing. Josh. Kind of following up on, on what Becky said, I, I think that the reason that very little's happened from the Affordable Housing Trust perspective is that an extremely disingenuous developer who, in my opinion, built the town, um, 
the homeowners over at Boynton Meadows, um, has handicapped the ability of the trust to get additional funds from town meeting to explore some of the alternatives that Becky was talking about. Um, additionally, I think that the town has a certain amount of responsibility to force the developer of Boynton Meadows uh, Meadows to follow through with his obligations to finish that project. I saw in our correspondence recently a letter from one of the members over at the condominiums over there um, that the project's sitting in the lurch um, and that we need to be able to do something to leverage the position of the homeowners to see that um, this project's completed. And in so much as there's no bond being held by the town or the planning board or anybody, um, I'm not exactly sure, but we did have an appeal from those homeowners, Mark. Yep. Um, They're working with the planning board, Joshua. I understand that. But um, again, there's no bond, there's no anything. So I would like to see what actions we could take as a select board to um, encumber some kind of funds, place a lien, do something on this to, to force their hand um, to get this job done because these folks who are living there are taxpayers living in an incomplete project. And it's really tough to be able to move forward with another project, um, whether it be the Affordable Housing Trust or another entity, when the one that we engaged in um, has worked out so poorly. So, this is my two cents worth on that. So we'll continue to work, uh, work on this. The, the final goal, um, I, we've completed it, uh, subject to town meeting uh, approval. Um, and that's the data management and IT. The committee department has presented their findings to the board in July. They recommend to stay with the current software package and look at purchasing additional capabilities. You saw in my anticipated uh, fall town meeting budget the, the money to do that. So <coughs> I would say I am very pleased, thanks to the support of the board, the department heads, uh, Don, and the work that we've been doing town council, that we are really close to achieving all of our goals this year. Kudos to, the, to everybody to get that done. So that's, I was very excited to give this update today. Very excited to give this update today. Unless there are any other questions, let's move to the next bit of information. And I see Bruce and Mary and Bud are here, and Josh is here, and I'm here. And that is an update on Prescott. So you will, yes, John? Before we go very far, I do not understand what the headings of these columns are meant to be. <laughs> okay, just, well. It's just, I don't know what they're trying to show here. So maybe we could start by explaining what what these columns and the labels that they have Absolutely. are intended to identify. Mary and, and, and Bruce, you want to come up to the table? But if you want to come up to the table, so maybe I'm the only them. one. No, no. Um, I, I think too to jump on that that yeah. that this like some of the other things it would be great if there were sort of a standard thing that we're seeing every yeah, few months. This was our first. This was our first go around. And they followed on their income and expense line what they submitted when they submitted their RFP. So they follow, and please Mary, correct me if I'm wrong, they follow the same format as what they did with the RFP. So we pretty much looked at the same categories going down, but I'll let Mary and Bruce take us through uh, their budget. Bud's here, Josh is here. We went through this in great detail in great length uh, when we met with Bruce and Mary uh, a couple of weeks ago before Josh uh, left on so, his job. So is one of these columns that information from the RFP? Yes. Yes. Column one is the, is the original Correct. budget that they, they put a three-year plan together. Remember yes. that? Yep. yep. Column one is that. That first column that says okay. budget. Yeah. Wait, wait, column wait two. With just column one, is there any meaningful difference between proposed year one budget September 18th to August 19th and the year one budget September 18th to August 19th. Yeah. Why well, is that the titles twice there? But That's what different. I'm trying to understand. They're different which, titles. Which one are you looking at, John? One calls it about a proposed budget. The other says a one-year budget. The dates are identical. Yeah. There's only well, one set of numbers. Right. Well, wait, wait. the first column is the budget that they put together for year one. Okay. That was the budget they put together originally. So column two is no, actual. What? Is actual year centric. one. It's a it's a projected where they think they're going to end up against that budget year. So That's column two? one, column two and column three. One is where they are through July, and they said that now they have a, where they're currently sitting, and then they say here's what we think the projected final is going to be. 
So if you look at that column, it says they, they're, that's where they believe the numbers are gonna end up for that year. So we, is it the case that the names of the columns yeah. have simply been duplicated? There's no significant meaning to the difference in the wording or anything else to the double heading. First four rows have been repeated in the printout. Okay. Sorry. I can understand, I understand that. Um, now, um, thank you. Yeah, Go ahead. Looks like they've been repeated. Go ahead, bud. Yeah, we had the meeting in July, so you can see in that middle section, July 2019 was what we actually had and then we projected what we would end with. Over the, the remaining two months, July. Right, August. right, because our fiscal year, year ends August 30th. But we are obliged by our lease to meet in July. So that's uh, why we're showing you uh, what we think is pretty good news and we're ending on a, on a pretty high note here with our projected versus our actual. So the, does it, on the gross profit line, is that is that the ending? Is that what you're talking about? No. Oh. That's the revenue line. They call it gross profit. It's revenue. Okay. There's terminology that was used that's different than we're used to. Mm -hmm. That's okay. a that is a revenue line. Okay. But to follow expenses up expenses are below that. The, just to use the gross profit line as an example. Mm -hmm. The first number is what was projected for the first year. Mm-hmm. The 91, yes. The 91, mm -hmm. 880. Yeah. The 82, 580 is what is anticipated at this point for the ending of the well, first year. They, well, we discussed this at the meeting and it wasn't corrected here. I brought, yeah, it wasn't. I brought, brought I brought the correct the, copy. That this was all I had after the meeting. Yeah. The 82 number should have 8420 added in. So we got the corrected number. This is uh, where we're ending up. So look at some of the CN it also shows you, because you might be asking about year two and year three, we can yeah. get in there too if you'd like to look at it. Uh, so realistically, when, when do things get closed? Allison, did you just give one or two? The actual end of our fiscal year is August 30, 31st. So they'll be officially. So just in terms of the workload, I mean, is it, will we have something you think in September or are we looking into October? Mm. Uh, final numbers, is that? We have very little to worry about closing out because our utilities are pretty well paid for and projected. We know here what, our end, what we're gonna okay. be paying our employees. And we aren't running any programs during the summer. So uh, closing this out, I think you'll okay, agree, please, is pretty yeah. easy. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, so we'll close it out pretty quickly. But I think from what you see here, from what we planned to uh, what we ended up with, and if you're looking at the sheets, you'll see some, some of the major differences were in our class tuitions. We projected that we would make 33,500 in tuitions. We Mary, actually made 40,000. can you 40, help us understand where, where that is? Where's that line? This is under income. Oh, uh, well, the screen The is, screen's wrong, huh? The screen is a little different, but yeah. Well, okay. the only thing that's different on the screen is they're all correct, except it doesn't add right. Those no, numbers, numbers and these right. numbers just doesn't add identical. identical. Here's what we projected, 33,500. We ended up with 40,000 in income which leads us to believe that the programs that we were providing fall, winter, and spring uh, were, well, we know they were well attended and we have about 700 registrations over those three semesters. So we made more money on our programs than we anticipated. We have, uh, the other big part of our budget comes from uh, long-term space rental. We, of course, didn't get our lease with you until so we were a little bit behind the eight ball in getting our rentals in. But even without these not being full year rentals, we hit the mark of 12032 And we 
we project next year 23,000, we have secured four leases for next year as long as I'm pointing this out. We have four major leases signed for next year and already we've hit that $23,000 number for next year, which is we have $26,000 in leases tied up for next year. What does the one, so on our sheet there's a one in parentheses? Yes, that referred back to the report we gave you in our business plan to show where we thought the rentals were coming from. You recall it was uh, with a certain percentage of the, it refers to a pre the original report we gave okay. in our business plan. So uh, we tried to give you what we uh, what we had in our uh, so yeah, that's what he said. The only thing that's the only thing that's wrong is the eighty four twenty is not added into the eighty two. All the numbers are correct, it just didn't add down right by eighty four twenty right. left out. Wasn't added in so there? Add right. that in, that's the ninety one thousand right. dollar number that's on your sheet. And it just wasn't that, added right. All the other right. numbers are correct. The reason that was added last is because this is our crude assets. We came into this year having had a pilot year the year before from with the school district. And we, along with donations of our founding members, had accrued assets of $58,000. And we had projected we were going to take $12,730 of our accrued assets and put them in to, to uh, Prescott this year. To break even. To break even. When all was said and done, we're projecting that we're only going to need to, to put about 8,000 of our accrued assets. So the good, news, the good news about year one is that they were actually favorable if you take away that donation line. Take that, that donation, that funding 12, the one that they got us to break even. They, they, they were favorable by $4,000 on an operating basis. So they had more revenue and they spent less. So therefore they were favorable to what they said they were gonna do and that's like Mary said, that's indica indicative by the 12730 only being 8420. They had to take less from their cash fund to so make this So they balanced out their revenues. They took in what they said they were going to take in. And they spent. They actually less took, they they actually took in more, more than on an operating base. They Correct. took in more rev real revenue. Correct. And they spent less real cash out the door. So they actually were favorable from what they said they were going to do in year one by. Four thousand dollars, and that's very good. Because they didn't have to spend the twelve; they only had to spend yes, the eight. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when, when we met with the with the friends to go over the financial projections, from from our perspective, they did exactly what they said they were going to do in the first year, and we were comfortable with the numbers that they presented to us for year two. My concern in talking that day was: did they have those long-term rentals secured? And that's that $23,000. If you look, I have a little dash next to it. That was my concern going in, but now Mary has come in here tonight and said they have those rents secured to $32,000. We have $26,000 We have twenty-six thousand secured, and we have, we've hired Exit Realty to be our representative, and we have uh, rooms on the main floor that could bump that number up if those were rented partially or fully up to 33,000. So we think that the rentals, um, we're gonna hit our mark on rentals. Okay, so that, that was my, in, in the Russian <coughs> budget, remember, that was my one concern, and Mary has alleviated that concern tonight by saying that they have those long-term. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other important point to look on this chart, but if you stay right at the top of your mark. Sorry. They were, in order to break even year one, they thought they were going to have to spend 12000 They didn't. They only spent 8000 to break now even. Now they have nothing. Now they have nothing. That says they're projecting next, this year coming up right now that they're going to need no business contribution. So that a funding member, founding member contribution. So they said the revenue now, real revenue, is going to equal expenses. So they're going to break even, that's the forecast, without taking any money from their $58,000 so cash balance. So they're fund. 58,000 is not going to be touched, which is good news. Right. If everything goes according to, 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 right. to plan. Right now, they, you know, they, they spent, they made $40,000 in class tuition. They actually cut that down to 36 next year, so they're being conservative. 
in that number. They have long-term rentals in, in which they're providing, um, they have that, that covered, which is a major portion of their income. So the $97,000 budget next year, without touching their $58,000 reserve, is good news. So overall, financially, the friends have done and accomplished what they said they were going to accomplish in the first year. And I see no reason why that won't continue in year two based on what we saw, uh, Josh, Bud, and I saw when we met with them. Josh, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, but that's where that's where I see it right now. Um, <clears throat> no, I think that the two of you, and actually the four of you, collectively have represented uh, what went on in our meeting, and I certainly think that you demonstrated that you set a budget, and first-year budgets are awfully tough to, uh, to follow, and you had a few pitfalls, but you also had a few gains that you didn't expect. So those offset, and I think you've made the adjustments for the proposed year two budget appropriately based on what happened in year one. So, looks good to me. I have, yeah. I'm on the line here that says gross profit. Yeah. It really ought to say gross revenue. That's what we said in the beginning. That's what we said in the beginning. Because when I look at this right. sheet, that is revenue. The income and the outcome are balanced, so the gross profit is zero. Right. And that's what they said it would be. Correct. Well, I know, but when you look at this net sheet, profit. you could get yourself yeah, pretty net well profit. confused. It should, it, they should be a line. At the, first of all, you're right. That should say revenue. Then at the very bottom where it says total expenses, that's correct. And then it should have a net profit line. It should go zero, zero, zero. Right. Or some positive right. number in the future. Right. So they're missing, change that line and then add a net profit line at the very bottom, which is just simply a subtraction of those two numbers. Mm -hmm. And if I might uh, say that because we now understand what a stable budget is and we can project a little bit better for next year, this next year we're looking to provide more free community activities. We were very hesitant to do that the first year because we weren't sure if we would hit our numbers. Now that we know we have, we are providing uh, our space free to nonprofits. Any nonprofit organization that wants to have a meeting at Prescott can do so free of charge. And some have already started doing that. Gadef just did some planning there a couple weeks ago. We also have planning uh, some free activities, which will be announced in our uh, Prescott catalog. We're having a film series We'll be having a uh, crafts fair the first Saturday of the month, and we're going to be having a nonprofit fair around Giving Tuesday or Thanksgiving. So um, we want to make it a community center, which means not only that the community uses it for rentals, but that the community can use it uh, for no charge. And that's what a non Don't want to give too that's much what away. a nonprofit is. Don't want to give too much away. No, no, we've got to balance, keep it at zero or yep. profit. So I'm proud to present our catalog. This is going to be coming out in all the mailboxes next week, so you're getting a Xerox preview copy. I'll pass this out to you. So overall, I'd say the first year was successful. I want to thank Bruce and Mary um, for working with us and opening the books for us, as they are required to do yep. under, the, under the lease, but I think things, things went well. If, if the board will indulge, 30 more seconds on, on this subject. Um, I want to update you on where we are with the, thank you. Um, thank you Mary, with the sprinkler system. Um, Bruce has taken over as the project manager. Last week I went to see the Community Preservation Committee and asked them to put a placeholder article on the warrant uh, for the Springtown meeting, which I've added with their permission. Bruce is in the process of procuring an engineering firm to do the specs. It is our hope that Bruce gets that done by uh, middle to late September. We will go out to bid with a two-week turnaround because we've already reached out to some of the sprinkler companies. They want to see the, the design. We have an anticipated bid opening date of October 16th on the sprinkler system. Depending on what the numbers are, we will either have to go to town meeting for additional funding from CPC or not. I'm hoping not. We don't know. Um, but that is in process, and if we can get that done, that will give me even more confidence in the projections from the friends because now they'll have access to additional space within the building to rent, which is would be good news. It's critical um, for year three. 
for year three. And that's when they have to stop paying us at least $20,000 in income. Uh, rent, I guess you would call it, plus a certain percentage of their profits, which I hope are huge. Right? Is that the plan? So anyway, that's all in process, and I think we're, we're moving in a, in a, in a positive and direction. Is it also true that if and when the sprinkler system is installed, it loosens some of the restrictions on what can happen in the building? That well, if, if an alarm system along with a sprinkler system is installed, uh -huh. then we've been told by the state fire marshal and our fire chief that then, uh, once again, we can offer classes for children uh, mm -hmm. if, because then we might be able to revert to the educational code, building code, because those, those are required. Now that we've been recoded, we have to uh, right. apply to the brand new code. Okay. So that will provide us more opportunity because then now children will be back in our classes. This budget doesn't provide for that. And we'll have access to the second floor. I can say right now that a lot of the people who are inquiring about rentals are looking for office space and they look at the second floor. We don't necessarily show it to them, but they go up there. And that's the kind of office space people want, small, private office space. The rooms that we have right now, 750 square feet or 350 square feet, seem a little large to the, some of the small businesses. So we're looking forward to getting to the second floor and redoing the lease with you. So that's all I have uh, on that. Thank you, Bruce, Mary, yep. and uh, Bud, and Josh. So that concludes um, the town manager's report. We have some stuff under uh, other business which the yep. board can um, take up. The first issue is something that Josh asked to be put on um, tonight's agenda uh, before he had uh, left, he wasn't at the last meeting. Uh, the specific issue was whether or not to post the um, select board packet prior in advance of, of, of the meeting on Monday night. Um, <coughs> Josh and I have had some spirited discussions, I would say. On the, on the subject matter. Um, so I'll let Josh give his piece and then I'll respond with my piece. Well, I've been approached by a few members of the community who, when they saw certain issues were upcoming on agendas, they wanted additional background information. And at first, uh, we had talked about this as a board a number of months ago and decided that you know, we should not publish the whole packet uh, online. Um, and I was in agreement at the time because I get to see the packets every time they come out. So I really don't have any question on the background and backup information on things we're going to discuss because overall um, Don and uh, Mark do a very nice job putting together that information for our purposes. So when a couple of people spoke with me about upcoming issues, they didn't understand the rationale behind a few things and said, well, if you publish the packet, Certainly that will give a tremendous amount of background, not just to you, but to the public at large. Um, and I thought about that after the fact. And other than executive session um, issues, um, I saw no reason why not to publish the whole packet. And during the, what Mark called, spirited discussions that we had, um, he made a couple good points that a lot of the information that are contained within the packets that go out to us are subject to change and that it's given at, um, at a, a point of time and over the next two or three days, numbers can change, additional information can, can come in and Mark's concern is if we publish the uh, information, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, and the numbers do change or circumstances change, that next thing that may occur is the public will be saying, well, that's not what you had in your packet, and why are you discussing it like that? So from that perspective, I've rethought this again, um, and I think that if somebody wants additional information at this point, that they should reach out to a select board member to discuss it, or reach out to the town manager, or show up at one of our meetings. Yeah, I um, I've given it, Mark, I've, I've come around back to where we were. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. They were, I'm not going to say anything. I, I'm there you take go. the win. Yeah. Uh, so, is there any other debate on that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, I thought that was too easy. I have not come around to that. 
Um, I, I thought for a long time that we should be releasing the packet to the public, and I frankly do not. I, I guess I'd like to hear from you, Mark. What is the argument other than, well, the information might change, and so someone would two, two specific have examples. the wrong expectations? Yeah, two, that's, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Two specific examples have come up in just the last two meetings. I sent out the charge of the, and that was one of the issues that people were looking at, the major initiative planning committee. I sent it out on a Thursday. It was the draft. I received feedback from several members, and I provided an updated charge on Monday. Now, if I had published that revised charge, and it changed significantly from the Friday to the Monday, we added that whole $30,000 piece, which was a significant change in the, in, the, in the charge. I post that online. Bruce Eason goes online, reads it, says, oh, okay, that makes sense to me. And then all of a sudden what gets adopted, and he doesn't go back and look to see if there was an update posted to the, to the agenda. And now all of a sudden we change it by adding a significant change to it. Well, now all of a sudden Bruce is like, well, wait a minute, that's not what I saw. What's the problem? Tonight, another example, I sent out budgetary information to you, but now I gave you supplemental information uh, prior to the meeting tonight that allowed you to look at and have questions. That wasn't in the packet. I'm just not comfortable putting it up online because I don't know if Bruce or Mary or Bud or Judy or, or Connie is gonna look at it, and then I don't know if they looked at it, I don't know what they know. It would be more helpful for the people to contact me if they see something on the agenda and say, hey Mark, is there some backup information you can give me prior to the meeting? That happens a lot right now. And I can tell you, I see Anna sitting over there. Anna asks sometimes, she sees something on the packet. Hey, can I see what's on the agenda tonight? Can you send me that information? Absolutely. We, we, want, we want to be transparent. We want to give out information. I'm just uncomfortable posting it when it's subject to change. That's my, that's my argument, and that's the argument I made with Josh. Okay, well, so um, I don't think we're being transparent, and I definitely think that we should be. Um, I actually had, someone had told me, I don't know, at some point in the past that the town of Acton did publish their uh, packet ahead of time, so I called to find out. And uh, the person in the selectman's office there said, yes, they, they make it public as soon as it's distributed to the board members. They have a hyperlink to, they use some system called DocuShare. So, and I, I did go on the website and I could see that everything was there, every individual document that was gonna be discussed. So, of course things can change between Thursday or Friday when we get it and Monday, but that can, there's a way around. I mean, we can, we can work with that because whatever is posted publicly can have the update also added to it. Um, I think people, will be better informed, they'll come to a meeting and ask better questions or they will understand the discussion if they're watching at home. Uh, if they have the opportunity to read that material ahead of time, those who care about a particular issue especially. Um, I have been in the position, I've been called about, can you tell me what's in the packet about XYZ issue? Um, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to do that, but I'm not always available, and sometimes um, that's not the most effective way. And I, and I can't, you know, because it's a one big PDF file, I can't even copy out that particular bit of information and email it to someone. Um, so telling someone over the phone about a, you know, a page of figures <laughs> is not very efficient. But there's another aspect of this that I think is really important, and that is that the information that comes to us in the packet and gets discussed at the meeting, it's up on the screen, it is not saved on the website. So there is no place that we or any member of the public can later go back to refer to it. And I think that is a, a, a tremendous failing for ourselves and for the public. I mean, I know I have tried to go back and find a document that we discussed six months ago, and you know, last time we talked about this issue, and it's not there, and, and I think it should be. I mean, I don't, I guess I think it's surprising to me that we haven't um, had some complaints about this, because 
these are public records, and I think that they are supposed to be saved. We talk about them at the meeting. I think they should be made public ahead of time, and I think they should be saved on the website, and I think that we are, uh, we're failing the public by not doing that. John? Uh, I've got a couple of thoughts. Um, one concern I have is that uh, when we start, if we were to start putting the whole package out there, you know, we'd really have to freeze that package at the point we put it up there. Mm -hmm. Because if things do change in the two or three succeeding days before the meeting, there's no way to get the word out to everybody that, oh, this particular document has had a change, unless they're subscribing and we change the agenda. Um, and it concerns me that it may hinder us getting the best information available before we come to the meeting. Because we put this wall in there that says, you have to deal with at the meeting what we closed out three days ago because that's what you showed to the public. So that's, that's one concern that I have. Um, I have another concern is I'm always happy if someone calls me and, and wants uh, to have a piece of whatever is in um, the agenda package. Uh, because one, I can tell them that I'm gonna give it to you but it may change. So don't go to, don't go to the bank with it we come to the meeting and I can go in there and cut out any page, any collection of pages and move it over into an email and send it on its way. So I'd much rather they call me personally than us locking it down three days before the meeting. But it's a PDF, you can do that? Yeah. I mean, I it, is, it comes as a PDF document. I guess I just don't have the technical skills to cut part of it. I have out. several tools that will just cut it out, take an image and turn it onto a mail. So it is doable. And I think it's a better approach. I'd rather have a conversation with them and give it to them and say, <coughs> you know, this is what it looks like right now, but it could look a little different come the meeting. Mm -hmm. So if it's important to you, please come to the meeting. That's where I'm at. So for me, I struggle a little bit because I don't think that the packet is intended to be a standalone document. I'm hesitant to kind of release it because I think people potentially will grab that information in advance of a meeting, think they're informed, and then miss out on a discussion or a change of direction. Um, the other concern I have is that, you know, there are, there are things, even as a select board member, there are times that I read something on the agenda and I have to call the town manager and, and beg him to tweak my memory and, and get things kind of up to speed. And that the, the packet isn't intended, nor could it ever be kind of a, an entire history of an issue or something that it's 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 very hard to share information like this that is intended toward one audience kind of those of us who are following along on a week by week basis with another audience which is folks who are potentially kind of popping in and out with varying levels of of interest and in information um, I don't know I don't I don't think there's a good solution. What about yeah, right. the uh, what about the matter that we are not saving this information? Everything's saved. So that I really don't understand because within your Google Drive, I don't delete anything that's in there. So you can go back to the first meeting you were at as an elected board member, and you can access every single packet up until today. That's at your hand. Can the but the public cannot do that. Correct. But, but the public, I mean, the, the minutes are the record of the meeting. And those are online. And that's, I mean, that's part of, part of the, the, right. the intent of the minutes is to capture what actually went on at the meeting, not what was presented in advance as a potential direction for discussion. So we're up to date. Don has done a phenomenal job keeping minutes up to date, and they're posted as soon as the board approves them. She posts them the next morning. <coughs> So um, I don't know how uh, other towns that do publicize the packet deal with the fact that information changes. I do think that um, that is a solvable problem for us, and it isn't solved by saying we won't make any changes. 
because I agree, John, that that would be, um, you know, that, that would be a, a step backwards in good government. Um, but this, the system that I saw Acton using, the DocuShare, uh, I assume has a way of saying this is an updated version. It's been updated. The, and yes, that does, um, it does put some responsibility on someone and there will be times when someone will not have seen an update. But I think in, given the broader picture of the benefit of people wanting to know what we're talking about, um, we can put plenty of disclaimers on a website that say this, all this information is subject to change. Please call if you have questions um, and you know, you can subscribe the way you can subscribe and get notified if, I get notified if there's been a change in an agenda um, for certain committees that I signed up to, to learn that about. If, if there's been a change in information that's been distributed, I think we can easily overcome that issue. I think the broader, the bigger thing to think about is why are we not sharing this information freely with the public? We, may I? Yeah, and then we're going to go to Bruce. Okay. We do a, I, I, you know, you said before you don't think we're transparent at all. I, I, I disagree with that emphatically. I, I think we do a really good job. If anybody wants information, we provide the information right away. My biggest concern on this whole packet, the one day that I forget to do an update or not go back and, and, and put something out, and they come to a meeting and say, hey, wait a minute, that's not what we saw. The board looks at me and say, well, what are you doing? We get busy. I don't want to use that as an excuse, but there could be that one time that either Dawn or I forget to do something on an update, and then everybody's looking at us, why didn't you do it? And that's an added responsibility that I really don't want to have the responsibility of. You know, we, 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 there's a lot that went on today before this meeting. A lot of information. I had meetings all day today. And you know, if I didn't get a chance to go back and update something, um, then you're going to look at me and say, "Why wasn't that done?" And I, I just don't want that added burden. Sorry, it's, it's an added burden to Don and I that I'm just not ready to take on. Bruce. Yes, yeah, so I'm really sympathetic to the idea of disclose, disclose, disclose. That's sort of the nature and where I come from. Um, so I think there is a technological solution and. And there has been for some time, uh, and maybe there's better ideas, but um, this RSS, real simple syndication, is something that's that's been around for a long time. So if you click on something to download an article uh, or a piece of information, you're automatically signed up for a push. In other words, whenever that document changes, whether you request it or not, you get a copy sent to you. Um, and you can do that to either the entire packet or you can break it up into pieces as PDF documents so that if you only are interested in one particular topic on the agenda, when you click on that and get it, and it changes, it comes right back to you. Uh, and also the PDF should have sort of a watermark on it in, in fairly bold, uh, indicating that this is a preliminary document and that you should check and sort of have that on every page. I would recommend that you talk to your IT department and see how difficult it would be to set this thing up and if it's not too difficult to, to try it for maybe a month or two and see if these potential difficult situations actually arise or not and then sort of do a reassessment after a couple of months and see if you want to continue it or not or whether it turns out to be more trouble than it's worth but at least for the, for the public uh, I, I think it's definitely a benefit and you, you can evaluate whether it's a, a benefit for you or not, given, given the additional work of making sure these things get published in a timely manner and the IT department knows what to do with it. Let me ask you a question. So they would have to subscribe beforehand? Mm -hmm. But basically when you download the document for the first time, you have to put in your, you, your you, email address. <coughs> mm -hmm. And then whenever that document changes, um, basically, the system sends you a new copy of the document, whether you request it or not. So what about people that 
can't subscribe, wouldn't subscribe, they'd be left out, that we wouldn't be disclosing anything to them if they're not asking for it. Yeah, there's always the guy that's living in the cave, right? And um, there's, there's a lot of them. It's uh, it's something that that's difficult to deal with, um, and um, or or maybe someone that's not internet savvy, like a senior, or uh, yeah, if they can't subscribe, they're not going to get it either. Yeah, basically. And if we're going to do it, we better do it for everyone, right? If we're yeah. going to be fully transparent, fully, we need to. So if you were able to come into the town hall, then basically we, we could create a, an account for that person. Just, just in the way of, yeah. of getting the document the first time, you can get it the second and third time. You might not get notified that it's been changed, but that's sort of the cost of doing business if you're not sort of up to date with what's going on. I think Josh. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take the benefit of uh, having our town council sitting on the other side of the room on this. And I believe you've answered this before, Paul. But uh, we have no legal obligation to release the packet. Is that correct? What, in advance of the meeting? Yeah, I was going to say, ultimately, these are public records. Absolutely. And for the use of the meeting, we have to produce it. But you do have ten days to produce it. So if someone gives you a public records request on a Friday, you don't necessarily have to give an answer on a Monday. So the answer is ultimately you have to produce what you used at a meeting, what was given to you, those kind of communications. It's not the stuff in executive session. And, and very that doesn't require you to Post the packet or not post the packet. So, one more question. Um, you also serve as a selectman in another community, is that correct? In the eight terms. Do you release your packets in your community in advance of the meeting? We take the position it's not an all or nothing. In other words, you're, you're debating here do you release the packet? Do you not release the packet. There's a lot of stuff, you know, a letter from Verizon, you know, a, a statement from DEP that they're going to be doing X, Y, and Z, or mosquito spraying. There's a lot of communications, but why would you hold back and not give it to the public? On the other hand, there's, there's stuff that the town administrator is working on that we consider, and there's an exemption under the public records law for policies that are in the process of being developed. So some of the town administrator stuff, we don't put into the packet because he's working on it. So in that town, we don't say everything gets released, and we don't say that nothing gets released. We release 80%. Could I follow up with another question yeah. for Paul? Uh, between you and your fellow um, members of your firm, uh, you deal with several, with a number of other towns in Massachusetts. Can you just give us a sense of what normal practice is on this question? <laughs> I knew he was going to answer that. that way. Um, that was awesome. Thank you, Paul. So, you know, at this point, we've we've talked about this recently. We've talked about this now for a few minutes. Um, pragmatically, I'm I'm not sure exactly what the problem is that we would be addressing. Um, I mean, conceptually, yes, there's a, a transparency in information, but I'm not sure how big an issue this is and really how much, whether this rises to the top or the top 10 of our priorities list. Um, so, I mean, if someone wants to make a motion or a suggestion, 
we can talk about it, but. Let me see what kind of feedback we get from the public after this discussion. If anybody really wants it and we get a large outcry for us to release portions of the packet, then we can take this up for consideration. But if nobody contacts us or nobody contacts the town manager or, or Don, uh, looking for this information over the next three or four weeks, especially after Connie plastered on the front page of the paper. Um, <laughs> and uh, if, if there are questions and, and a desire for it, we can take this up again in the future. But if anybody sees anything on an agenda prior to Monday's meeting and they want a copy of it, we don't take 10 days to get the stuff right. out. Very rarely do we take 10 days. Mm -hmm. There might be a reason for it, but if somebody calls up and asks for something, you got nothing to hide. Here you go. Have, it, have at it. Yeah. Mary? Um, my guess is that many people don't even know there's a packet that's presented before the meeting right. to the selectmen. And even if they do know that there's a packet, they don't know that it's available to them if they ask. Um, I know as a, a person who does presentations in front of you, I have not ever asked for a, your packet. Sometimes I have called Mark to say what's, and if I'm on the agenda, what are you, what are you thinking of putting in the packet? But as an example, tonight I wasn't aware of what Mark had in the packet Otherwise, I could have given him the, the corrected copy from the meeting. That's just an example. So perhaps one thing that could be done back to the transparency issue is just, and Connie Sartini may help this in her news story, is to let people know that there is a packet. And if you'd like a copy of it in advance, you can call the selectman's office. Uh, I mean, we are talking about having critical conversations in our community and people, people being more well-informed, then they could come to the meetings uh, as well-informed as you are with the latest packet. And I know I, I might request packets, and in the, I have to say in the past, I really didn't think that was my business or that I had any right necessarily to even look at the packet. Connie? Um, I just want to point out another thought that came to me. If the select board starts doing this, that is, putting the packet out, does that mean the community therefore expects that every committee will be putting their packages out? Now we, now we become a paper factory. <laughs> Uh, and the administration of, and I've worked with systems such as Bruce described, and, and they're very good, but they're generally on a team of people that are working on a project. And when the project's over, that thing just gets uh, archived and, and, and it's over. Where what we're talking about here is people would have to want to call in and say, gee, I don't want to receive that anymore. And somebody administratively would have to pull them out, or it could be automated if they, if they you know, it depends how much you want to spend on the on the, the, the system, but that's also a consideration here that I, I think we should think about because it really does create a significant amount of work administratively to well, uh, be the administrator of that system. So, so um, I would just, I think Bruce's suggestion that uh, a conversation with the IT department might be useful in that, and, and with the board's permission, I would like to have that conversation with with Mike Chasen um, to explore, because a couple of years ago, I know um, the board before I was on the mem before I was a member of this board had repeated requests for some sort of notification, some sort of email notification, and 
Um, and that got created, and I think it's been quite successful. So like I said, you can, and maybe not everyone knows this, but you can go on the town website to, the, I think it's called the control center or the meeting center or something. You can sign up to get notifications if you want them of when, um, and you can do this for any committee in town, when a document is posted to the website, when an agenda is posted to the website, when there's been a change to an agenda for that particular um, committee. And um, it was, I know it was asked for repeatedly, it took a while, and then all of a sudden it happened and it works very smoothly. I know a number of people who rely on it and, and use that system, and it doesn't take any um, administrative time. So I guess I, I personally would like to get a little bit more information. It's not my intention to burden anybody with, with more work than is necessary, but if there is an easy way for us to move in the direction of releasing certainly more of the information, maybe the stuff that has is not likely to change, um, and, and to inform people that there is a packet. And, and in fairness, John, I don't believe that most of the other committees in town have the kind of, and the volume of, and the depth of information presented to them before meetings that we do, um, and I think the stuff that we are discussing may be um, of more important, of more significance and more important to more of the population than Having served than on others. three elected positions over the last 12 years and dozens of committees, let me tell you, you go to a planning board meeting and the pre-reading is a binder of about three right. inches. I, okay? more than I understand that, yes. Yes, absolutely, because it's full of drawings, it's full of all kinds of things. Mm. So let's not oversimplify right. uh, what the burdens are in other groups where we haven't resided and walked in those Indian moccasins. That, that is true. I did have a family <laughs> member who did that, <laughs> so I know. Um, but. Correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of those uh, plans and all, there's, there are separate uh, requirements for where they have to be publicized beforehand. I don't know what that means. Can we just give it a month and see what the public has to say? And if we need to revisit this, we will. I mean, I suggested that 15 minutes ago. It's 9 o'clock at night. We have other things to cover. Mm -hmm. And I think we beat this rug pretty clean tonight. I'm willing to move on. Just a suggestion. I will report back to the board if you I get inundated. Just let us know if there's a yep. sudden. Mm -hmm. And please let me know if you get inundated. Yeah. And that doesn't mean the same person calling you 30 times. All right. <laughs> I just make a little joke, I'm sorry. So the, the next item on our agenda, equally scintillating, is the select board email address. Um, currently, we talked about this a little bit last week, the last meeting, I think. Currently on the webpage for the town, there is one select board at townofgroton.org email address. It's clearly called out that that comes in to the town manager who responds to things that are within his purview. He shares those requests and responses with us. I don't think it's a, a tremendous flow of information back and forth. Um, and then there are, with our pictures or the space for our pictures, all of our individual email addresses are there so that if someone wants to reach out to one, yeah. one of us or one at a time, they can do that. Um, part of the concern in the past around the select board email address has been inadvertently creating kind of open meeting law violations or, or snafus um, when we all get excited and start responding to things. So um, I think we, we had tabled this to this week so that Josh could be here and partake of this conversation. One thing I want to point out, Allison, before you get into that mm -hmm. is um, Becky had pointed out on the town manager's page, and I believe we corrected that. Yeah, thank Where's you. Where's your picture, Don Dunbar? <laughs> they lost it. They lost your picture? <laughs> it's with mine, it got lost too. Yeah. <laughs> Don and I'll go together and get a picture. Get a picture taken, Don. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank, so you, thank you for you making for that, that change, Mark. That's yep. certainly better. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know, Becky, I don't know who, I have no current concerns with how this is put forth or handled. So I'm not sure what we're going to talk we, about. We've talked about this over the years at, yes. at various different times. And I think that the one way, if we were to make a change that I would deal with, uh, 
or how to deal with this is that there's been concern in the past that why is the town manager reviewing stuff that is coming to the select board intended for the select board? And the way I look at it, 98, 99% of the information is pretty routine mm -hmm. and up his ballywick and things that he can address right away. I think the only time it would ever be a situation that might not work would be is if the email concerned the town manager. So as a way of dealing with that, maybe we could put something in the information page for the select board for contacting us that would say, if this concerns uh, the town manager and you don't want him to read the email, then send the, the email will get sent to the chair of the board of selectmen or the select board at the time. Doesn't that do it right there? It's pretty clear in red. You send something to the select board at townofgroton.org, it's coming to the town manager. Right, but I think, it's, listening to what Josh just said, I, I think there are times when someone may want to contact us um, and for whatever reason, and this isn't personal to you, Mark, I understand. that they want to contact us with a comment about the person in the town manager's role so they don't want that email to be read by the town manager. And rather than suggest that they write to all of us individually, perhaps it should say, like what Josh just said, uh, if, you're, if you have a concern about the town manager, you don't want your email to be read by the town manager, please contact the chair whose address is below. I think that, that would be a good addition. Could that person not send it to each select board member or Absolutely. all five or three? Or We've gotten into trouble over Well, they certainly about. could. But, but the answer is yes, they certainly could. Um, if they copy us all, we're still in, we, we can't, we have to be really careful about responding. Um, and didn't, it, is there some policy about? We have a policy in terms of responding um, to individual members of the public as an individual board member. And um, I unfortunately was caught up in some drama a number of years ago over a situation like this. And as a result of that, um, we put a policy together. So I guess all I'm saying is, is that if there is a concern and somebody wanted to address an issue about the town manager, and again, Mark, this isn't about you, it's about whoever occupies the town manager's position, that by saying, uh, if you want it done confidentially, uh, then you should send your email to the chair of the board. As so, simple as so that. So if we add to the red that's section. That's policy. If we add to the red section something chair. that says, if you prefer to bypass the town manager, simply email the chair. I mean, just yes, something that would be great. I think that would be fine. Line. Well, I think that would be. I don't think so bypass. We're advertising. Right, right, right. We're advertising. Why have a town manager? If you uh, want to say that, Mark. No, right. Mark, it's, it's not personal. A select board it's, member. It's hard for it not to be called that personal. Board, I have to be select honest. board member. Send them email, or but then where are you going to make the phone numbers and the email addresses and available to people? Understood. I mean, I, I think we, it. You know, we could modify those pages where it now shows the term of office and who it is and who's a member and who's a chair. That's a piece of software that's been around quite a while, uh, and I don't know how malleable it is, but um, assuming it is, you could add those that information into that little matrix contact information. Are, are you talking about this page that's on the screen, John? Beg your pardon? Are you talking about the page that we're seeing on the screen? I'm not sure. No, I'm talking about a page where you go and you look up select board uh -huh. and it shows all our names. Right there. Well, this there is it. it. Is. This is it. This is it. Right. And that's what I was suggesting last week that where it says contact information and then it shows email is the select board. You know, I think it would be not, it would be useful. It would be helpful to say you can also contact the individual members. See their email addresses below. We can add that. That's simple. But I think the it's piece also. that Allison just suggested up there in the red, if it something that says if you wish to confidentially, you can you can con contact the chair confidentially directly at her address. I don't so. think the word confidential no. needs to be or in there Or whatever it was you said. I, I mean, I think if, if 
just like I had said before, if, if putting a note that individual contact addresses are below it takes care of it, I, again, I personally, I feel like we're yeah, you may a also, problem that doesn't exist. You may also contact select board members at their individual email addresses, which are listed below. You can say that in the red. Are you guys comfortable can adding you just, that? Can this you is add that really to the red? Yep. That'll solve the a issue. Good use right of anyone's there. time currently. All right. Done. Thank you. Let's see, that was easy. So in so our packet, we have three items left. Um, coming out of our conversation last week are the information that we got from the Board of Water Commissioners. Um, I talked with Mark and I drafted a letter that you can read um, it, around kind of my concerns and, and it's, it's a difficult situation in that the Water Commissioners are an independent elected entity of their own standing. Um, they don't report to the select board. We don't issue them direction or a charge or anything else. Um, so my concern was in clearly letting them know that, you know, that communication is something we value and that we're happy to help them communicate with the public in any way that we can. Um, letting them know that it sounds like there's going to be a, a significant cost to remedying this situation <clears throat> and that as such, we and the town manager and the finance team need to be kind of up to date as, as frequently as possible. Um, and then lastly, kind of it, it passing on the concerns that I've heard from the community around the, the delay in making this situation public. So I don't know whether folks have had a chance, I assume folks have had a chance to read this. It was in our packet. Um, I don't know what, I if people want to see changes, if people don't want to send the letter, if people do want to send the letter. Send Thoughts? The letter. Yeah. Um, yeah, Becky. In, in the first paragraph, can you scroll it? Um, I had, I did not understand that second sentence as it's written. Um, it, is it missing a word? No. I, I no. thought it, you were saying as you were, as since you, you were, were in informed February. in February, we were surprised. I thought you were saying that we were surprised that it, we weren't hearing about these issues until now. No, so, is that I, yeah, what you meant? To me, nope. the way she's saying that is, as they were surprised in February, we're surprised oh. now. I don't That's how uh, I was, as you were in February, you uh, were surprised, see? Okay. Really uh, right so how you, oh, okay. I thought that was, a very, that was probably the best sentence. It didn't, uh, it didn't read that way to me. I guess maybe I'm weird. <laughs> I move that we authorize the town manager hmm. to send the letter to the water commissioners as drafted by our chair. I'll second that. Okay. Further discussion, John. I saw your hand up. Thank you. Um, I would like to see included in this letter something to the effect that asks that as they as they look at these different alternatives, alternatives mm -hmm. right? They run an Excel program that makes projections. If you go with this solution, this is what the rate per gallon is going to be for the town, so that we can see what the impact is because it's conceivable to me if they're looking at solutions the impact of which are going to cause people <laughs> to shut off the water and dig a well we're not going in the right direction so that model as they develop this should look at the impact to the subscribers and then there's an impact to the town financially mm -hmm. um, in these solutions and that ought to be mapped as you look at each solution I can add that, Allison, with your permission. Some yeah. words to that effect. John, again, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding. You're talking about the impact as in the change in the reading? Or are you if talking I about the cost? If I increase the amount of money that the Enterprise Fund for the water department in the town center here, um, it means they have to break even at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go to the general taxpayer. It, okay. it does by default, but it's not supposed to. So if they go and spend umpty um dollars, they have to go and adjust how much they charge per gallon to make their books balance. Okay, so you were talking about the, the financial impact. I thought mm -hmm. you were first talking about 
how much of a change in the in the reading for manganese they were. No, I'm talking manganese. about the impact on what a subscriber would have to pay for a gallon of water. That's not argument. Maybe I'll read the paragraph. See, this is why we put this in advance so we can have a chance to look at it. And Leave now. <laughs> because if I have this in advance, I can't read it and comprehend it and listen to the conversation at the same mm -hmm. time. It's too confusing. It would be totally useless. Now that I have For the next two months, we should all send Buddy so, a packet. It you says, six copies a week. Based on what John just said, that paragraph, that last one is showing right there, it says the cost of remedying the situation, blah, 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 blah. It says, we understand that you have retained an hour. Yeah, I've retained a consulting engineer. No, no, no. We're, what happened? The, the point. Oh, right there. The second sentence of the first real paragraph there. The cost of remedy situation appears to be in the millions of dollars and will likely impact the rate payers and the community in general. To me, maybe that's not how you wrote this. To me, to me that as, as I read that, that means it's going to be a potential shared cost between the rate payers and the town, just like Lost Lake Water was. That's how I read that. Lost Lake Water? Lost Lake Fire okay. Suppression. Fire suppression. Uh -huh. that was, that's a Lost Lake specific million dollars, but right. they couldn't afford it, obviously, by themselves. So the town, because it was a safety issue, said it's the right thing to do to the community. This, what this says to me is that this is going to be expensive. It's going to, the health of the community is at stake, and therefore, it's going to be so expensive that the ratepayers probably can't do this by themselves. So the town is going to also share that because it's such an expensive and it's for the health of the community. That's how I read it. Is that how you wrote that? Yeah. Pragmatically, for me as an individual, yeah. Is that how you wrote it? I think that's how it's going to end up personally. Okay. And is I think that. that you meant, that's how I read it. Yeah. I'm not sure that's how. Oh, it's absolutely how I meant it. And, and I think. To say that. I mean, part well, of, I part of the, con the, the question becomes, and maybe I'm wrong, I don't know that for the school, for municipal buildings within the water department. That's going to affect the rate, the tax base, because we pay the water bills like everybody right. else does. So, so does the school department. So, but if they if they had three columns, and and they said this is this is the impact on the taxpayers of this solution, yeah. approximate. Here's the estimate of the impact on individual subscribers to the water department, because mo many of us, if not most of us in town, are on our own wells anyway. And this is the cost to actually do what it is we want to do. Yeah, all I'm saying is that there's going to be a number that's known for what the cost of this is. And then if it says it goes to all the rate payers, here's what it would be. And then the question is, is there going to be a split? That says, right. And, and that, I don't think, is going to be known until the well, so be, deals with you fill it in later, but at least you've got those two. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I just tracking. I, I didn't hear what you said. I, I heard you saying that the rate payers. The answer is to me, it's the rate payers and the community equal to the number. The number of people know what it costs. Certainly, that one or more of the solutions would require a, a, a tripart. Right. I just want to make sure I understood the way that Allison wrote that. <laughs> but others won't. So. Right. So the, we're the, in sync. The board you and I are. has amended the letter with John's suggestion for Allison's signature. Have you guys voted yet? Well, John and and uh, Bud's suggestions. You got I amend my motion to reflect that mark. Thank you. I'll amend my second. He amends okay. a second. I'm almost hesitant to ask if there's any further discussion. No. Seeing none. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, Thank you back to the ongoing issues list. I've covered a lot of that in our in our weekly update. Oh, you want this iron and manganese added to the ongoing issues list, correct? Yes, yes. I think so. I will do that. Um, just to, we've, we've already covered a lot of this stuff here. The only thing that I want to, uh, two, three things I want to update you on. Uh, Florence Roach Elementary School, we received eight applications for the, for the designer. Um, myself, the... Um, School superintendent and a member of the school committee, Mr. LeBlanc, are the three representatives who will serve on the state designer selection board. We're in the process of reviewing them. We will be going to Boston on September 17th to meet with the full board, and hopefully either we're going to make a decision that night or we're going to do interviews. I will keep the board in post, but that project is, is, is ongoing. Library roof repair, staging is done. They're going to be starting the repair. Highway garage renovations, uh, the contractor is doing 
what he needs to do to get that done in five months. As a matter of fact, I think they are right on schedule after a month and a half into the project, uh, which is good. There are some additional costs that I'm a little concerned about. We'll be meeting on that. The building committee is going to be meeting uh, next Tuesday morning to review uh, issues. But that project is moving in a positive direction uh, as well. So that is all I have for updates on the ongoing issues. What's up with the sidewalks on 119? Nothing. Uh, I, I thought that project was done. The reason the board asked me to leave that on is until I install the, after town the meeting, crosswalk install the crosswalk. The crosswalk. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we still have cross, uh, electronic crosswalk signals to be done here in front of the salt and light. As well as. And we have, we're going to ask the town meeting for about $14,000 to put a pair in front of the Florence Roach Middle School crossing over to the First Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. So that'll come off the list soon. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so that last item there. Yep. Um, so uh, I will start by saying this is kind of informational only. Um, I have been aware over the last few years, there's a number of ways that voting happens differently. Um, I think ranked choice voting has been in the news. Uh, there was actually an article just in yesterday's Lowell Sun about the Lowell City Council and the Lowell School Committee deliberating about different ways that their membership will be elected, and this was driven by a lawsuit um, for fair representation of different ethnic communities. So that's not what's, what we, I think, need to be concerned about here, but I think we should be aware that when we vote for members of committees, there may be other ways of doing it that might um, might be an improvement and might not. And, and I don't actually know how to evaluate that, but I did do some research. Uh, Barry had provided me some information, um, and the the and I have an article that I will share with ask Mark to send to everybody. Um, mostly just to read and be aware that there are some other ways that we might go about voting. And it maybe at some workshop meeting, we might do a, some experimental ways to see what it, how they play out. Um, it's hard to sort of understand this all just with a verbal explanation. Um, and I'm not necessarily recommending that we make any changes at this point, but I think it's worth reading the article. The one method that we might end up at some point wanting to use is called cumulative voting. Um, it's the easiest to understand of the several ones that are mentioned in this article. The article is by some a nonprofit group called uh, Fair Vote, I think is the name of them. Um, Cumulative voting is something that a lot of people actually are probably familiar with. If you've been to workshops where you're given like five stickers and, and you're supposed to place them on the things that you have the highest priority and you can put more than one sticker on the priority. So <coughs> we used this years ago, the Prescott Committee when we had that Saturday morning thing. Um, so basically everyone has the same number of votes. So for instance, we're going to be staffing a committee that we need to have five members. So normally we would each choose five members. In a in cumulative voting, we would have our five votes, but we could vote more than one of them for one person. So if there were only three people you really wanted to get on this committee from the dozens who applied, you could you could put two votes for one person, two votes for another person, and one vote for another person, instead of one vote for five different people. I do not know whether that would result in something better or even different. Um, so that's why I think we ought to think about it and maybe do an experiment at some point and see what that would get us. Uh, but I'll, I will send the article to Mark, ask I'll him to send it to the rest of you, yep. ask you to just think about that, whether there's any usefulness for us at some point in the future. Is this the same article that Barry sent to all of us no. that you're referring to? It's another one. No, okay. this is different. 
The stuff that Barry sent, I have to say, I read it several times and I could not make sense of it. So. Okay. The next item on our agenda is the Select Board Liaison Report. Does anyone have a report? All right. We have one set of minutes from August 12th. I don't know if anyone had any corrections or changes. If not, I would entertain So I did send one suggested addition. Is in that the in the packet? Okay, good, because I didn't bring a copy. <laughs> um, this was on the uh, discussion about the manganese issue. And I just thought that, um, so it shows up on page two of those minutes in red. Don put it there. The sentence says, that I suggested we add said board members asked questions about the possible solutions being considered by the water department and also about the estimated cost of seven and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. I thought that the price tag should show up in the minutes. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes as amended. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Very, good. Abstain. Very good. Then we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.